Good morning. It's good to see here, see y'all here today. Everybody here is isn't it a wonderful day to be able to come and worship the Lord and sing songs of praise to Him. And uh, we're so thankful for the rain we received last night in the middle of the night. So drying out a little bit. <coughs> we want to continue to remember those that are having issues. Uh, uh, Gloria Farr is a. Uh, Kathy's mother, Kathy Jones's mother, she's uh, back in ICU, and also she's stable but not doing well. She's still having a, uh, going through some hard times here. So if you would keep her in your prayers, uh, and things will work out to be in accordance with God's will. Also, Mildred Skinner has a urinary tract infection. Uh, remember this. Also, Roger Leonard is waiting on tests on his stomach issues. And uh, Linda Hester is waiting on further tests and procedures. So keep, keep, continue to keep them in your prayers. Frank Hester, however, is back in the hospital with stomach pain and pancreatic problems. Pancreas, I know that's a serious issue there, so let's remember him. June Nichols with his foot and leg issues. Uh, actually, the doctors are stumped on this note here that they can't figure out what it is, so. I feel if he gets to, you know, sees enough people, he'll figure they'll figure it out eventually. Let's keep him in your prayers. Aubrey Webb's elevated PSA. I just continue to keep him in your prayers, and also pray that we'll be able to reach him a little bit, and talk to him about coming back. Catherine Thomas is in, still in rehab. Kenny Chance is still the same with the growth on his neck, and also pray for him that he will uh, receive some knowledge of teaching here and there. Uh, Joanne Guy, uh, Cynthia Hay, Lossie and Shirley Abbott, they all need continued prayers. Just remember when you pray, the, those that are listed, God knows who we're talking about. He's got infinite wisdom and he can remember a lot more than we can. <clears throat> also, July 9th at 345, the Habanero meeting is scheduled on Ju July 9th, that's next Sunday. Uh, the Habanero meeting, try to make this at 345. Some good work going on. We've got some good cards this past time. We've got some good contacts. So we continue to work with this. I think it'll, it'll work out for us. Lord willing. If there's uh, nothing further, I'll, uh, I'll leave with a word of prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the time we have here. We're thankful, dear God, for each one that's here and fellowship that we have. We're thankful, dear God, for Jesus who came to this earth, earth and lived a perfect life so we could have the forgiveness of our sins by obeying the gospel as we have. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with each one of us to continue to learn as we learned in class this morning, to continue to grow, dear God, on the meat of the word and also to be able to teach. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with uh, Brother Roger here in a few moments as he breaks into us the bread of life, that he'll have a ready recollection of what he's prepared. And we as students, dear God, will search the scriptures, dear God, and to, with the eagerness to learn your will. We pray that you'll be with Steve as he leads us on, in the singing. We pray that each one of us will sing with the understanding, dear God, and to lift up our voices to you. We're so thankful for you and all that you've done for us. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those we just mentioned that are on the sick and prayer list. You know, each one of them, we pray most especially for uh, the Far family. We pray that you'll be with them, be with Sister Kathy as she's going through this time. We pray, Heavenly Father, for also uh, Frankie, dear God, that you'll be with him as the doctors look into what's going on with him. We're thankful, dear God, for the jobs that we have and our income. We're thankful, dear God, for everything that you bless us with. And we pray, dear God, that we'll always be uh, thankful for this and not take it for granted. We'll also pray for the government, dear God, and the elections coming up. We pray that, dear God, that whatever happens in this election, we know that it will be your will. And we pray, dear God, for whatever it is that we will support, dear God, the things that are in your laws and that we will always look to you for what our guidance in life. We pray that you'll forgive us of all our sins and continue to be with us each day. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Four. 
Oh, uh-huh. 
After this song, Brother Roger will bring our message. 438. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand. about the Son in chapter 1. For one thing we see in verse 5 that, that Jesus was not an angel because the question is asked for which of the angels did he ever say, you're my son, today I have begotten you and again I'll be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And then again he brings the firstborn into the world. He says and let all the angels of God worship him. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 22 the apostle Peter says of the statement that that he is the, of the son that he's talking about the resurrection of Christ. That's a very critical point in the understanding that the Jews needed to have because we know that this letter was written to Hebrew Christians who were as we stated before, either on the verge of apostatizing or they already had. That is, they had on the verge of falling away from Christ or they already had. This letter was written to prevent any falling away, if at all possible, on the part of those who were the recipients. And the main thing that the writer lays down in chapter 1 is that Jesus is God. Because of verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. We also see in chapter 1 a prophecy of Christ in the latter part of verse 12. Your years will not come to an end. That's a statement that has to do with the eternal nature of the Son of God. There are many religions that have been established over the millennia. And every single one of those founders, unless that founder is still living now, is dead. 
Some of them, they know where their tombs are. Jesus' tomb was found empty. He ascended to the Father in the presence of his disciples. And Paul would write in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that at one time Jesus appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. And then he ascended back to heaven. These Hebrew Christians were having a, a problem. I, I don't know all of the reasons that some of them were struggling with their faith in Christ. The text made some implications at times. There would have been some measure of persecution. The writer doesn't dwell heavily on that. He just dwells on the fact that some of you are falling away or already have. And so because Jesus is the Messiah that the Jews would have been looking for, and that he is now sitting at God's right hand. For this reason, verse 1 of chapter 2 says, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Go back with me to Acts chapter 2, when the first gospel sermon was preached by the apostle Peter and the other 11 apostles. There's no question when you get to the end of Peter's sermon that Jesus was indeed the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy as the Messiah and the Savior of the Jewish people. And we also know for Gentiles as well. And, and they were finally convinced that, that they had made a tragic error in having Jesus crucified. And so in verse 37... They, the Bible says they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They said, What do we do? We've killed him. What about what do we do? He's, maybe he is in heaven, but we're guilty of murder. Well, that wasn't all they were guilty of, but that particular case certainly stood out, did it not? Repent, Peter would say. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. But if you go back to something we see in verse 1 of chapter 2, go also down to Acts 2 and verse 42, that we see that the early Christians were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. And that's what the writer here is talking about. You need to pay closer attention, or we, the writer says, to what we have heard. At some point, these people had heard the gospel of Christ. They had learned, for example, from Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, that there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The Jewish people would have heard this first. That's why we read in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Jewish people were the first to hear the gospel message. They had a background or a history with God. They would have known the Old Testament prophecies and the prophets and the promises. They knew that a Messiah was coming. Many of them were convinced. But at some point they began struggling with, I don't believe their struggle was necessarily being Christians as much as it was being affiliated with Christ. I believe they were losing their conviction about Jesus actually being the Messiah. Well, if that's gone, then Christianity for them is gone as well, is it not? Because Jesus is the foundation of what we consider and call Christianity. And so he says, you need to, we need, we need to pay closer attention to what we have heard. Precious people, I want to say something. We've been studying for the last several weeks in Bible class on things that a new Christian ought to know. And it's been a good study. Some of y'all haven't been in here. 
I don't know why. I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying you hadn't been in here, but I know this, you need it. Do those Tony and Steve and I are rotating it as teachers, and I promise you, every time I study for a class, I'm learning something myself. As we studied this morning in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, there's a time when you ought to be teachers. But but there's but you come to a point where you need to be taught again. The Lord has commanded those who are new Christians to be taught, and that's the example you have in Acts 2.42. A person who ceases to con continue in studying the Word of God on a regular basis will be weak at best. And he or she is vulnerable to being moved away from Christ by words of people that are contrary to the will of God. And it happens just like it did in the parable of the sower in, in Luke chapter 8. That the seed that fell by the wayside, Jesus explains that he says you know if you look look with me in Luke chapter 8 beginning with verse 11 where Jesus explains the parable he said the parable is this the seed is the word of God and those beside the road are those who have heard what's the writer talking about in Hebrews 2 1 things that you have heard when the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. That's why some people won't be converted. Now, the devil never takes the word out of a person's heart against their will. We, we, we open or close the door to truth with our own dispositions. But the devil's behind the removal of the seed. And the second thing we see in verse 13, now those on the rocky soil, they're the, they're the ones who when they hear, they receive the word with joy and they believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Do you know what our tools against temptation are? Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 4 that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Obviously, these Hebrew Christians would have heard some of these things. And, and the writer says you need to pay closer attention to what you've heard. I want to ask a question. I don't want anybody to raise their hand. But how many of us in this room right now can take the Bible and teach somebody else what to do to become a Christian? And how long have you been one? And if you can't do that, do you need to pay closer attention to what you've heard? What if you had the need to restore someone who had fallen away from God? And how long have you been a Christian? Do you have at least some idea about how to take the Bible to restore someone to their first love, to use the scriptures? We all, including preachers, you think, we know it all. No, we don't. I study all the time, and every time I study, I learn something new. We all need to pay closer attention to what we've heard because the devil, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he's after you, and he's after me. But if I've got the <coughs> word of God hidden in my heart, so that I will not sin against God. The devil has no power over me whatsoever. Something else that the Hebrews writer said is he talks about the value and the power of the word they had heard. In verse 2 he says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so, so great a salvation? The Jewish people knew that angels were simply messengers. And the writer is saying that over the millennia of the Old Testament era, angels had something to do with the conveyance or the revelation of the word of God between God and man. They played a role in it. It had something, and obviously, and specifically, <coughs> To do with the law of Moses. They knew that the law of Moses was the law of God. There was no question about that. And they also knew that there were penalties for violating certain aspects of the law of Moses or the law of God. Some of those, some of those had to do with capital punishment, put to death. 
Some of them had to do with other things. There were levels of punishment. But the point is, they knew that that law carried with it penalty for disobedience. And yet, Jesus is the final spokesman of God and carries more weight than the law of Moses. And so he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You could not be, as a Jew, saved under the law of Moses. It did not have the capacity to save. It was nothing more than a set of rules. It took the death of the Son of God, the blood of Jesus, to pay the price for sin so that we could be forgiven. Precious people, that's the great salvation. We studied this morning in our Bible class from Titus chapter 3 and verse 11 that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, and live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. What has appeared? The grace of God to whom all men. For what purpose? To teach us how to live a godly life versus an ungodly life. But Jesus made that possible. The grace of God is more than just the death of Jesus. Paul says it has something to do with teaching. What is the writer talking to these Hebrew Christians about? Paying closer attention to what you've been taught. They did not have a copy of the New Testament at their disposal. They would have been dependent on the prophets, the apostles, inspired teacher in the first century, and having a good memory and regularly attending the the assemblies of the church to learn. They couldn't go, they didn't have Bible class books, they didn't have a copy of the New Testament, but they were they were still held accountable for knowing the will of God. And if and you understand that there's a penalty under the law of Moses, there's a greater penalty under the law of Christ for disobedience because it's a greater salvation. And he says after, in verse 3, after it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Now at one point, or several points in time, the, the Jews would come to Jesus. We want to see a sign. We want to see a sign. And Jesus said a rebellious and adulterous generation looking for a sign. And I, I'm convinced he said that because they really didn't want to see a sign. That they weren't. They weren't. They were disingenuous. They weren't sincere. But if you read the conclusion of Mark's gospel, after you see that the Lord gave the Great Commission in that account, that the apostles went out preaching, and the, the word they preached, I'm paraphrasing, the word they preached was confirmed by miracles, wonders, and signs. Why? In that the New Testament. How do I know that Peter's preaching the truth? He could work miracles, true miracles to prove that. Pentecost Sunday was a day of miracles. Speaking in languages those men had never studied. And the, and the Jewish people were astounded. As well. These are Galileans. They're not even educated people. It was God through the Holy Spirit making that happen. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the early church had gifts of the Holy Spirit. The same thing in other places. And so the word was confirmed by the miracles that were done. That word's been complete now. This is a miraculous product, isn't it, Jason? It's a, it's a miraculous product. It didn't just fall out of heaven. God provided this by the Holy Spirit to the writers. And so now we confirm truth by reading what we see in the Scriptures. These people are getting a letter. Who wrote it? I don't know. It really is irrelevant. If God ever wanted us to know who wrote it, he would have told us. But I know this, it was authoritative, and it was a very powerful letter. And also, we come down here to verse 5, that God did not subject angels to angels the world to come, concerning which we are speaking. But he testified somewhere saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? I like this right here. If you say... You know, I don't remember where the Bible says that, but it says it here. And the writer said he testified somewhere. 
And so they didn't have book chapters and verse books, chapters and verses. But if you know, if you can look at the reference, it was from Psalm eight. David wrote this. He looked at the stars and the heavens, and and he said, "Well, what is man that you're mindful of him? What's the son of man that you think about him?" This is a quote from that. Verse seven says, "You've made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor." And have appointed him over the works of your hands. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. This is talking about mankind at first. Read Genesis chapter 2. After God finished everything, he put man, in Genesis 1 rather, he put man in charge of the animal kingdom. It's all right to go hunting and kill an animal for food. I don't care what the, the idiots say. God says it's okay. We have control over the animal kingdom. It's wrong to abuse an animal, but it's not wrong to eat one for food. But we have control over the, the world. Why? Because we were made just a little lower than heavenly beings. Precious people, that's what God sees when he looks at you and me. <clears throat> I've been to Kentucky a lot. I have reasons for having done that. Been married to a Kentucky girl for 38 years. And they talk about these valuable racehorses and these how much these horses cost that they run in the Kentucky Derby and how much money can be won if you win. And I was so excited for that young fellow that won here a couple of months ago because he was an underdog, maybe an under horse. But at any rate, a lot of money, millions of dollars. Listen, that value of that horse does not come close to your value or mine. You know, you know what I think about those fellows that lost their lives a couple of Sundays ago? The most important thing was not what happened to that submersible. What happened to their souls after they died? Were they ready to meet God? It didn't matter how they died. It mattered how were they prepared to die. And the writer says, you and I are made differently. And we for we are sub, things are subject to us as human beings. And verse 8 says, he's left nothing that is not subject to us or man. But we do not yet see all things subjected to him, so he moves to Jesus. I believe Psalm 8 is a dual prophecy. There's the part that says you and I were made just a little lower than heavenly beings. One translation says a little lower than God. And that's all right. That doesn't make me God. But only you and I were made in his image and likeness. But Jesus is different. The Bible says in verse 9, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Why was Jesus made into a human being? Why did a, an eternal word, as John tells us, become flesh to dwell among men? Why, why did God want that to happen? That's important for these Hebrew people to understand. It's important for you and me to understand. Look at, the, look at the middle part of verse 9. Because of the suffering of death, somebody had to pay the price for sin. And it had to be a living being. It had to be a sinless living human being. The blood of bulls and goats, the writer will tell us later, could never take away sin. But God made Jesus for a little while. He made him human for the purpose of the suffering of death. Sometimes living the Christian life gets testy or challenging, doesn't it? How many, I'm not asking you to raise your hands. How many of you have been faithful at one point and you wandered away and you had to be restored? And what was it that brought you back? The precious love of God and the sacrifice of his son. It's like I was talking with a person recently and they said, sometimes I don't feel like going to church, but I have to remember that Jesus died for me and that motivates me. I said, well, if it works, it works. We do need some motivation, don't we? 
We need motivation for living. Jesus suffered death by becoming a human. But not only that, he was crowned with glory and honor. But these Hebrew Christians, they need to recognize that Jesus didn't just die. He's the Messiah, the Mashiach in Hebrew. The Christ in, in Greek, or for us, the anglicized word, that sits at God's right hand. And another reason he did this in the latter part of verse 9 is so that by the grace of God he might taste of death for every man. Sometimes the thought of death is scary. And you never experienced it. And according to Hebrews 9, 27, you're only going to experience it one time. It's appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. So we, we never experience that, but it's a reality. We are appointed to die. We don't know when. God's not telling us. No faithful child of God should be afraid to die. I didn't say afraid of death. That's scary. But afraid to leave this world to go to the next. No faithful child of God should be afraid of that. Listen to Jesus' discussion in John chapter 11. If you remember the discussion, this was the time when, when Lazarus was, had died and Jesus was talking with Martha. And Martha was concerned and she and Mary both said, you know, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. I believe Jesus let Lazarus die on purpose so he could come and prove his power over death as the Son of God. Martha, and so Jesus said to her in verse 23, speaking to Martha, your brother will rise again. I believe he meant in two ways. We know as you read the, the, the text here, the narrative that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. But he had to die again too. And if Lazarus lived a faithful life, he would, he would rise again. This was a unique situation. Martha said to him, listen to what she knew. I know that, that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Somebody had been listening to Jesus, hadn't they? They knew the resurrection was coming and it was going to be on a certain day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus had the power over death. That's what the Hebrews writer said. And I am the resurrection. One of the, reasons, one of the ways he was resurrection is he brought Lazarus back. In other words, he was coming back after three days. And not only that, I am the life. I am the life. John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody else can offer you and me eternal life. The Hebrew Christians needed to understand that if they rejected Jesus, they rejected eternal life. And only Jesus had it. Jesus continues with her and said, He who believes in me will live even if he dies. You know why some funerals are easier to preach than others? You know the person's life. You know how they lived. There's some funerals I wish they wouldn't ask me to preach. It's harder. And you understand why it might be. But the faithful child of God should not be afraid to die. But an unfaithful child ought to be scared to death to die. Ought to be scared to death. Because we know that only Jesus has eternal life. And Jesus said, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. The Bible does not teach faith only. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus said, was speaking to them all and said, if you, you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. And he goes on to say, if you, know, if you want to find your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. I believe Jesus' ultimate thought there was persecution to death in the first century. But what about between then and maybe never dying under persecution? 
Who do you live for? The Hebrews writer would want, who are y'all living for? Pay attention to what you've heard because you're listening to and giving heed to things that you ought not. And so we go back to Hebrews chapter 2. We continue with this discourse. And Jesus said, the latter part of verse, verse 9 says that he might taste death for everyone. There's nobody Jesus didn't die for. Don't you ever discount your value. So I'm not very handsome. I'm not very smart. I'm not very wealthy. God does not give one concern about that. Nor does he pay much attention to the most intelligent or the most wealthy or the most handsome or the most pretty. All he cares about is our souls. And aren't we glad that we're on equal, equal grounds with that? Now, that also tells us that anybody that says Jesus didn't die for them is, is sadly mistaken. He did now look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom all are all things. Who are you talking about? Jesus. And through whom are all things. Who are you talking about? Jesus. In bringing many sons to glory. Do you know what God's ultimate purpose was in sending Jesus to earth other than paying the price for sin and, and helping us be forgiven? He wants us in glory. This world is not my home. We're just passing through. And someday, somebody, unless the Lord comes back first, will stand by your casket and preach your funeral. But the truth of the matter is, you're preaching your own funeral right now. So am I. All we can do is just say a few words and hopefully some encouraging things. But Jesus wants to bring people to glory. Somebody says, what does that mean? I don't know. I've not seen it. I know this, if it's an eternal life and there's no more sorrow, there's no more death, there's no more crying, there's no more sickness, no more funerals, no more doctor visits, no more job losses or whatever, that's pretty good in and of itself. But it has to be better than that. To be in the presence of God and ultimately understand what that glory is. To see Jesus in his resurrected form in eternity. And you too, as a faithful Christian, you'll receive a resurrected body that will never die. that will never be hungry. We have to examine this from the human perspective because that's what we live by day by day. And he says, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. Why did Jesus die to make the source of salvation perfect? Jesus was not only deity, he was human. And when he suffered physically, he would have felt the same thing that you and I do. If you'd been crucified the way he was, you would have felt the same thing and he would have felt no more, no less. Or whatever he went through. Jesus became, was made perfect. And verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is the Christian's older brother. And if you want a big brother, he's the one to have, isn't he? Saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing praise to you. When we sing praises to God, read your bulletin article. If you didn't do it, don't do it right now, but after this afternoon about worship. Focus on worship. Jesus is here in spirit. The text is teaching that. You can't see him. He's not patting you on the shoulder. But spiritually speaking, he's with us. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Jesus is not ashamed to say, this precious Christian woman is my sister. This precious Christian man is my brother. And I need a brother like that, and you do too. But you need to trust him. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am in the children whom God has given me. When you become a Christian, God gives you to Jesus. 
That's what the Bible is teaching. Therefore, verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same. If you have any question about whether or not Jesus was actually flesh and blood, though he was. And through death, he might render powerless him who had power of death, that is the devil. The devil had power over death. And the, and the writer says he had power over death. What did Martha and Jesus talk about? Well, even if you die, if you believe in me, you'll live again. All the devil could do was have somebody die. He had no way of escaping. He has no way of escape from hell himself. The only thing the devil promises is falsehood that looks good and smells good and sounds good, but it's a lie. There are a lot of people living right now for the devil thinking they're going to heaven, and they're not unless they turn to Christ. This is very serious business this writer is trying to convey to these Hebrew Christians. This is serious, folks. If you reject Jesus, you're giving the power of death back to the devil. But Jesus is offering a way out of it. And it says in verse 15 that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. The Hebrew Christians knew that the law of Moses couldn't forgive. But learning through Christ, you can be forgiven. And because the price for sins has been paid by his precious blood. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels. But he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Did you know there's no plan of salvation for angels? I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 2 about verse 4 says that the angels were cast down to hell. There's, there's, no, there's no redemption for angels. Evidently they were in such a position they had no excuse for sinning. God gives us a little more leeway but he's not going to give it to us forever. He wants us to pay attention and realize I'm offering, if you be a Jew for a moment, I'm offering help to the descendants of Abraham. Who were these people? They were literally descendants of Abraham one way or another. All of them started with Isaac. Ishmael was the father of the Arab people. Isaac was the second in line after Abraham to bring about the Hebrew nation. But the whole purpose of God in working with Abraham that way was spiritual in nature. Go read Galatians 3, 26 through 28. That you're sons of God by faith in Christ. And that makes you children of Abraham by promise. Becoming a Christian does not make you physically in the lineage of Abraham. It's a spiritual promise. Now, these people gave great credence to old Abraham. He was, he was their hero of faith. And you are receiving the benefits of the promises that God made to him long ago. And so the text says in verse 17, and he keeps reiterating this, talking about Jesus. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things. If you ever question of how human Jesus was, read this verse again. That he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Not all the Old Testament priests were faithful. Many of them were not. Most of the priests, if not all of them, during the time of this writing, of course the, the system was already closed out as far as God was concerned. They weren't faithful. And even if they were faithful, they weren't perfect. They had to make a sacrifice for their own sins, if you'll recall, because they were, they were human. Jesus didn't have to do that. He was the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And he did this in things pertaining to God and to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's also found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He's, not, he's a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. Can I make this simple for you? There's a ravine here. 
you're on this side. The ravine is so far from where you are. If you go over the ravine, you're dead. There's no net too far up or too far down. On this side, there's salvation that God offers. God built a bridge, as it were, to help us cross over that valley of the shadow of death to make peace with God so that we could have that peace with God. I would to God that more of us in the church appreciated what God did because that's a precious, that's his grace, that's his mercy, that's his justification, that's his peace that he made with us, this propitiation. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he's able to come to the aid to those who are tempted. The last verse in chapter 2. Nobody else can help you when you're in trouble with God except the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Because he stands between us and God. And the writer is saying, you need to pay attention to what you've heard, but he's here. Later in Revelation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock and knock. He wants us to come to him. I want to ask you a question. Where do you stand with the Lord? I'm not being judgmental. I'm just asking a question. Where do you stand with the Lord? That's part of a preacher's job, to ask that question. Where do I stand with the Lord? Am I living for Him? Or am I just going through the motions of Christianity? The people have to beg me to come to church services. Am I here, but I'm really not here? I'm here in body, but I'm really not here. Jesus said, I'm able to help those who are tempted. Listen, you get over there in chapter 6. It's, it's, it's a study. We'll get to it, but it's like, there may be a point where you don't cross because your heart can become so hardened. And if the writer talks about it through the deceitfulness of sin. If your heart's reasonably soft and you know where you ought to be, it's time to come home to the Lord. When we preach and extend the invitation, it's not for us. It's for the Lord. The message is His. The invitation is His. And the writer and God, more than anybody else, did not want these Hebrew Christians to be lost. Where do you stand with Jesus this morning? Do you need to be baptized in mission of your sin? Do you already know what you need to do? Give your life to him? Don't wait around. Nobody's promised tomorrow. If you were to die right now, I mean, if you were to drop over dead right there where you sit, would you go to heaven? Do you think those people in that submersible thought they were going to die? I don't think they did. But they did. But there's one thing about it. There's a Lord ready to help us. Let him do so if he needs to help you as we stand and sing. <coughs> Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day on thee.
621. After this song, we will observe the Lord's Supper, 621. <clears throat> just sang the song that he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come down, he could have stopped all of what was going on and not allowed it to happen. He did this on his own accord. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's think about what we just sang. Let's think about his hands, his nail-pierced hands and all the blood that was shed from him and his body that was on the cross. And he did it all for, for everyone that would partake of his of what he did actually for his precious blood to wash us from our sins so that we can have a hope in he heaven with him, a home with him in heaven. What a wonderful sacrifice. If you would bow with me as I offer thanks, or as I have a prayer before I read. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what Jesus did. We're thankful, dear God, that we have this avenue through his precious blood to be saved from our sins as he washes our sins from us through his blood and that cruel cross that he went through we are so thankful for his love we're thankful for the love that you have for every man and every woman and every child on this earth that you look down upon all of us we are so thankful dear god this day we pray that you will be with us as we partake of these emblems we pray this in christ's name amen i'm gonna read it in first corinthians where paul reiterated the lord's supper he said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 
that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Bow with me and so offer thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what Jesus did again. We're, we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we partake of this bread, which is symbolic of his body on the cross, all of what his body went through, we pray that we'll think of this as we partake of this bread. We pray this in Christ's name. Ask Jeremy to offer thanks for the precious blood. Pray me, <clears throat> dear Heavenly Father, bless this cup that represents your son's blood that he gave on that cool cross. And we do all this in remembrance of him. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lose the Lord's Supper at this time. We now have the opportunity to lay by in store as we've been prospered, as the Bible teaches us to do. Just remember that it takes funds to keep the Lord's work going. And as we examine what we get each week, let's consider what we need to give back according to what what we make. At this time, bear with me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the wonderful blessings. We're thankful, dear God, for our jobs and and how you take care of us. We pray, dear God, that each one of us will look into 
each week, dear God, as we see our income to consider you, dear God, and consider the church and the work that needs to be done. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Remember the evening services at 5, uh, and if there's nothing further, we'd like to ask Brother Steve to lead us in the closing prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much today for this privilege to assemble here with the saints and to worship your holy name. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your plan of redemption. Lord, we, we pray that we will uh, order our lives every day in view of eternity and what you have done for us and what you expect of us. That we might be that light shining in the world to reflect you and glorify you. Lord, be with us as we depart that we'll be safe. Lord, be with those so many who are in need of prayers, some who are unable to be here others that we know of, Lord, that you know their needs. We ask that your hand would be upon them, that things would go well, that their caregivers would do the very best, and that things would work out for the good. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.